When you make a game, all you start with is a blank piece of paper and a few big ideas. I wanted to see a game that was in full 3D, but where the primary focus of the game would be interaction with the enemies. To the best of my knowledge, that had never been done before. How do you end up with a video game world that pulls you in? How can you make it stand out from other games? Your team will hit development walls and have to search for breakthroughs. Here's the inside story of the making of Spyro the Dragon in an exclusive tour for the PlayStation Underground. The most difficult part was the beginning. Uh, determining what kind of game we were going to do after Disruptor. Craig Stitt said, you know, I've always wanted to do a game about a dragon. I've always loved dragons. To me, they are just the greatest creature. I mean, it's the combination of a Tyrannosaurus Rex with, with wings and breathes fire. I mean, you, you've got the best of everything in a dragon. And immediately everybody said, yeah, that's it. Because dragons can fly, they can run, they can flame, they can jump, they can do anything. And they're cool. In the game, you play the part of Spyro. An evil creature named Nasty Nork has cast a spell turning all other dragons into crystal statues. You have three major objectives in the game. The first is to rescue all the dragons. The second is to collect the treasure that Nasty has stolen from the dragons. And the third goal is to defeat Nasty himself. Designer Mark Cerny had come from such games as Disruptor, the Crash Bandicoot series, and Marble Madness. In Spyro, he had new ground he wanted to cover. I had this idea that you could do a panoramic 3D engine on the Sony PlayStation, where there wouldn't be any fog in the distance. And I challenged Alex Hastings to create such an engine. Most of what it takes to, to pull off that sort of panoramic engine that comes around in, you know, assembly draw routines. In fact, I told him very specifically how to go about creating it. He blew me off and did something totally different. But it turned out much better than what I had in mind. Engine to draw the environments has broken down into seven different little renderers that work on different levels of detail of the environment to, to try to keep this, you know, the fact that you've, you're seeing a quarter of a mile away and what would be tens of thousands of polygons into something that's more manageable. Because not only did you have these big long views where anything in the universe could be seen from afar, but also he created an engine where you could have detail on the objects that were close. The real trick is that in every transition we try to do is a fade or morph transition, something where you're not going to see it. I think there's never been a console video game where you got both of those. He had to write some damn good code. The fact that this game is coded specifically for the PlayStation is probably our biggest advantage. When you compare it to, say, a PC or a other console platform down there, the PlayStation is really different. The things it can do well is it can draw an enormous number of polygons. That some of those guys have 5,000 polygons in them. You'd never try to do that on any other console. Well, I think the flying levels really were a surprise for us. Everybody loved it. We made sure that we had more of them. I, I played the flying rounds, the free flight rounds over and over again, trying to you know, get through all the obstacles in the shortest amount of time and, and, and trying different paths to see what if I can beat the record. You can easily waste an hour or two doing that and not even realize it. The DualShock analog controller really allows a great feel and a good freedom of control. You can just point it any direction you want and you're going there. And they've integrated the feedback in there too. You can uh, ram yourself into a wall and you'll just feel it come back at you. The game also has features especially for hardcore gamers. In every single instance where you can super dash, there is a secret place you can get to. That is our challenge to all the really good players out there. Not to go out and buy a hint guide or read about in the magazines, but to find out for themselves where it is they can go or what it is they can do. Another feature that pulls you in is the soundtrack. Spyro includes some well-known voices. Don't worry, the only one who's going to be trapped is him. When we were putting together the, the voice of Spyro, we talked to Carlos Alzraki first and um, last, as it turned out. I think we went through about maybe five or six versions, you know, where he was like really, really young and had nine all up in the nose, and then he was like really cooler and older, and they actually recorded something like that. But then they found out he was too mean. So then we just kind of did a mixture in between the two, where it's kind of like he's really kind of a go-getter kind of guy and kind of tough, but really kind of nice. Be on the lookout for North Commandos. 
Spyro. The other big voice part of the game is with the dragon. One of the voices that we've relied upon a lot is Clancy Brown, who's a well-known actor who was in uh, Starship Troopers. The dragons are freed from their crystal, and then they give him advice and, and tell him how to play the game uh, cryptically, you know, to teach him how to fly, how to use the buttons, uh, where to go, what to say, who to do, who he has to fight, who he doesn't have to fight. As soundtrack and gameplay come together, is Spyro a world that pulls you in? It's already had an effect on the team. Actually now, if you walk around the office, a lot of people speak in the voices of, uh, of the characters. What? What? Album, album, album. 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 Album.